I would like to welcome everyone to the Roxborough Roundtables. My name is Jessica Putman and I am the student coordinator for the tables. Today our topic is racial and class privilege and our host today will be Kevin Perry Louis. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so our topic today is privilege, but I wanted to focus mainly on the tools that we use to discuss privilege. And obviously the most explicit form of privilege that we can discuss is racial privilege because that, that has the, the clearest side of facts. So um, Webster's Dictionary defines privilege as a right or benefit that is given to some people and not to others. So that's this ba the basic dictionary definition as opposed to the sociological one. And I wanted to know what privilege meant to each of you in the room before we went on. So <laughs> have a definition they'd like to share. As I predicted, the first person, <laughs> always as difficult, this is Evan Lane. Uh, David, why don't you start? Hi, I'm David Pagan, a senior mechanical engineering at for the U. Um, for me, privilege would be just anything that you could do, that anything that is given to you or allowed for you to do that isn't allowed for anybody else. Okay. Let's go around. Becca? Um, to me, privilege means um, like a social, um, like societal thing that's um, not decided by anyone, that's just input into society and um, it affects people negatively and some people positively, but it's unfair. I'm uh, Freddie Hump from uh, University of Oregon, um, our National Student Exchange. Uh, student here at Philly, and I think privilege is an inherent benefit that a particular race or class receives that uh, other classes, races, genders don't necessarily receive. I'm Jermaine Smith, and ditto. <laughs> 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 but I also want to add that there, um, I think we all have different forms of privilege. Um, like uh, hi everyone, my name is Dean Tinsley. Uh, my definition is a bit Britannica too. It's um, privilege to me is defined as like a benefit or a right, uh, just as, not just associated, but uh, that can be granted to an advantage group unknowingly or knowingly. So. Hello, my name is Ashley Cummins. Me, privilege. I agree very much with what the other gentleman said, and to carry on with that, it seems that privilege a lot of times goes unbeknownst to those that are privileged. Mm -hmm. um, we've come to a point where uh, people take advantage of it and don't show appreciation for it. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a Law Society major, senior. Um, privilege to me is pretty much what everyone has been stating, and kind of going off what's your name again? Ashley, what Ashley just stated, um, it also becomes a topic where, like, even when you try to tell someone that they have privilege or try to, like, point it out just to let it know, like, it is there. It seems like the people who have the privilege don't want to acknowledge it or say, like, no, this isn't real. Like, I don't have any better standards than you. Like, I don't have anything that's helping me more than you. So it becomes, like, a touchy subject and very, like debatable, especially on certain types of privilege, rather it be like class or racial privilege. So. And I'm actually really glad you made that point because that's where I was taking this next. Um, the definition that we're going to be focusing mainly on for the purpose of this roundtable is one by W.E.B. Du Bois, or Du Bois, how you say it in French. <laughs> um, and in 1910, he wrote this essay, The Souls of the White Folks. And in that, he describes the wages of whiteness. And it's this idea that there was a, uh, a courtesy and a deference that came with the privilege of whiteness. And that white people weren't specifically aware that they had this privilege, but that black people were constantly living with, this, with the knowledge that there was a disadvantage. And I feel like this applies just as much in 2015 today as it did in 1910. Okay. I mean, I agree, going off of what that whole statement is, because even today, there is still such a thing as, like, 
white privilege in a way. Um, of course, like other people who are, because like I've heard from people who are white but poor say there is no such thing as white privilege because I didn't get any benefits by being white because I'm still poor. But then they don't notice that they're walking down the street with their friend who happens to be African American or any other minority race and that minority race is the one who gets questioned, interrogated by police officers while they're the ones who gets to keep walking or the officer doesn't even like pay any attention to them. But it's not just because you, you kind of had like white privilege, but not in the same way as if you had white and middle class class privilege or rich and white privilege. And that, that's an important point because the idea of privilege is to say that whiteness or masculinity or heterosexuality or whatever sort of privilege that you may be carrying is a direct precursor to success. It's to say that it is advantageous in similar circumstances. And that's and it's, so it's really important that we, first of all, that we discuss this on a societal and structural level as opposed to an individual and um, entirely like personal anecdotal um, level. Is that all right? Just setting up the rules of engagement for her, <laughs> the rest of us. Sure. This is Jermaine again. Office student engagement, I say that before, I just don't think I did. But I think it's it's important to note that privilege does not equal wealth or exactly. money. Yeah. Because a lot of times when we talk about privilege, people it's like, well, I struggle, I had to do this, I had to do that, and does that mean you have more money yeah. or you know access to resources like that? than me because I happen to be African American. It means there's those innate societal benefits that you get just by being who you are in regards to your race or gender or sex and things like that. I just want to stress because you said anecdotal and it's right. so important because a lot of people make anecdotal arguments. And what that means is that they say, well, it didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. um, and who cares? Because if it's on a societal basis, when you're looking at things that make sense, you look at the larger groups. You look at the bigger picture, not the singular picture. So anecdotal is interesting, always interesting, but usually irrelevant. And that's why it's important, as you said, Evan, to uh, go on the larger picture. And to stem from this idea of looking at the larger picture versus um, uh, singularities and per, like specific examples, the first reaction that there always is whenever you mention the, sub the topic of privilege is what I like to call the Obama argument. This idea that having exceptional black people in, in predominantly white or privileged spaces is, is, count like, is a counter argument to the existence of privilege. So it's the same argument with like the Tiger, the Tiger Woods argument or the Serena Williams argument that the fact that these exceptional black people exist in um, predominantly white and racist spaces is a counter argument. What do you guys think? I don't like her. <laughs> well, m my name is Ashley. Um, there is this amazing TED talk by this woman who uh, named Adichie. I won't try and slaughter her <laughs> first name. Um, but she has this amazing discussion and it's titled uh, A Single Story. Mm -hmm. um, I suggest all of you to see if you haven't already. But the main point is that the one of our main problems with society is that we're always viewing things from a singular side, mm -hmm. uh, a singular argument, a singular perspective, a single story, which is what's causing a lot of the problems. We need to be able to break free from our comfort zone, walk over to the other side, and listen to another person's point of view and see within your own eyes another person's perspective. And at least for me, I felt like that completely um, positively changed who I was as a person because that forced me to be like, okay, well, we need to not just think about how I feel or how it affects me, we need to think globally, we need to think internationally. Um, I would say, like, with your examples of, like, Serena Williams, for example, yeah. and it's like, well, Serena Williams made it, but then if you look at the inequalities that she's facing in her nativeness, yes. made up a word, but, um, <laughs> you know, there's the other tennis player, I think her name is Marina, and I'm not going to try to say her last name in fair butchering. You brought that up. Right. Yeah. But she's making, like, I don't know how many times more money than Serena is making. And Serena is this multiple-time champion, 
meet her several times. And so there's been a lot of discussion even about that piece. It's like, yes, she can be deemed as exceptional in this field, but there's still that level of inequality that she has to face. And even people's responses to her, her body type, right. things like that that are attributed to a certain race is still up for discussion. So it's like, if you look at those things, it's still apparent that there is some type of privilege working there. Right. That's actually a very good point, and one that I wasn't going to make. But it's not simply that she had to be the greatest tennis player to have ever lived, to be recognized. It's that despite the fact that she is such an exceptional player and is recognized, that still comes with the currency of blackness, which is uh, the prejudice that she experiences in her day-to-day -day life. How about the President Obama? Yeah. <laughs> okay, seriously, do you think that if he was white, he'd be treated the same? Would he be called a non-American? Would he be called all the things that he's been called? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not simply the direct, explicit racism that we have to talk about, because that also that automatically places that, us back in the idea of discussing individual racism again. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about the societal construct of racism. There's this... Um, the implicit analysis test, which is this, it's a test that allows you to, <laughs> it's, it's supposed to test your immediate reactions to ideas and concepts, and that test was given to predominantly college students, actually, those who are supposed to be the most liberal and the least prejudiced of groups, supposedly, and the test came back as like over, the, overall, the overwhelming majority of people associated blackness with negative ideas. So it's not this it's not something that we need to discuss on this individual level where a racist person in Kentucky exists. It's this idea that we all carry the cultural heritage of American racism and the sl and slavery. This is Jessica. I think that also kind of goes along with like back in like I forget what year it was, but like the Race, like the doll experiment where like they yeah, gave them yeah, black doll and everything but I think that's just something that's embedded it's like can you explain what the doll test is the doll test was basically they gave all different kind of little kids especially like African American little girl little kids um two dolls one was black one was white and then they asked her different questions like which one do you think is good which one do you think is bad which one do you think is beautiful which one do you think is ugly for all the questions that were very derogative like ugly bad they all stupid they always chose the black doll which it's the doll they're the same exact doll they look exactly the same like the only difference between the two dolls were the color but i think that's just something that was taught subliminally through messages that you receive through the media like the news when you show a criminal depending on what type of criminal like a black criminal normally is their mugshot where Dylan was, Dylan, Bruce, yeah, his mugshot was him, nice, dressed, <laughs> calm, like nothing, like it made him look like he was sick, not a criminal, which he was. Like, I don't understand, like, I think the way things are portrayed through the media and through society kind of paints a picture for people <laughs> subliminally to have that message already embedded into them about different races. And with the doll test experiment, like the the test was first used during Brown versus the Board of Education, which means that it is dated in some ways. Mm. But it was performed again in 2006 in North Carolina, and very little has changed. These little girls are still growing up with the idea that their blackness is immediate inferior inferiority. And whether or not they learn otherwise as they age, that idea has been subliminally, subliminally planted in them from such a young age that it can't be really left. And with that, like, we have to, I hate to pull this back to the ideas of um, exceptionalism, but that's kind of where I was guiding this. Uh, but it's. <laughs> It's this idea that because of this white supremacy that even young black children are taught that you need, it's where the idea of respectability comes from, that you need to be exceptional in order to be accepted. And I have a Chris Rock quote, and I know it's not nearly as eloquent as it should be, but he's, 
he talks about how in his neighborhood only four black people live there. And him, a like a very well-known comedian, Mary J. Blige, who's in like probably the greatest R&B singer of all time, Jay-Z, who's a very well-regarded rapper, and um, Eddie Murphy, famous multi-millionaire uh, comedian and actor. And he talks about how the person who lives next door to him is a dentist. Not the greatest dentist in the world, not like a guy who's winning plaques for removing plaque, but in every, <laughs> Good in, every, line. in every dentist. And this is supposed to show that the way that black exceptionalism is held at the same level as white mediocrity at every level of life, even with these examples that are supposed to be extraordinary, with like your Serena Williams and whatnot, these people are still not performing that well. And even today, black upper, upper class families still live in poor, poorer neighborhoods than their white counterparts. So then how does this the idea of exceptionalism being the only way to defeat racism continue to pervade our society? I'm throwing that question to you guys. Um, I don't think that exceptionalism, yeah, it doesn't prove that we're post racial or anything, because yeah, it's saying just because they're the exceptions, they, they might help other, you know, youth, other young people to believe that they're not stuck in the you know, cycle of things, but all it does is really help the young people to get that they're not in the cycle. It doesn't really do, I don't think it does much to the greater society think that the cycle's still not going. Right. So I think that exceptionalism argument is just helping individual people. I don't really think it proves that everyone else accepts right, right, right. everybody equally. So you think it's more trapping than it is helping because it's, it's allowing a few select people to, to escape while allowing others to believe that they can, which leaves them inactive in a struggle. Um, I guess not trapping. I guess I would say more like he is keep going to go more like um, dodging of people who don't admit it. I think it's more like a scapegoat. Right. Saying that, oh, these people did it, so that means it's not happening. Whereas, those people did it, doesn't mean it's not happening. Those are just exceptions. Right. Like, yeah, pure exception. I think he said something kind of as Evan as Kevin. Um, <laughs> Evan or Kevin as Evan, whatever. It's, I don't think it's that other people think they can get it. I think right. the problem is with people who are, don't have privilege is that they might look at it and say, well, Serena is exceptional. Right. Barack Obama is exceptional. Oh, it's but it's not, I think it's the point you're meeting, but if I'm not exceptional, even mm -hmm. if I'm real good, mm -hmm. I'm not going to make it. Because right. I've looked at the different companies. How many blacks own companies? How many black congressmen own them? Right. How many black senators own them? And when you look around and say, unless I'm this genius like Obama went to Harvard and did all these things, if I'm just good, I look around, I can't make it. I think that's the real backlash. And this is the, I'm sorry, Jess. And going off of what Evan just said, um, and then the other problem is, did you guys hear about the student Ahmed? Yeah. And how he built a clock? It's like, he was exceptional. That's so brilliant. He built a clock from scratch. And being as though he was Middle Eastern, and like he had that look to him, he had like a Middle Eastern name. Yeah, it the teacher automatically thought it was a bomb. Called right. the cops. The cops automatically was like, "Oh, exactly who I thought it would be." Never met the met, yeah. never met the kid before. It's like, how do you think this was going to be the person who's going to walk in here if yeah. you've never met the person? But just because of where they're from, like, I think that if even though he's exceptional, being as though he's a minority and like. That interaction with the cop could have been so negative to the point where, even though he knows he's exceptional, it could have just like crushed everything. Like he wouldn't think like I'm not going to build anything ever again because automatically they're going to think it's a bomb. What's the point? So it kind of just crushed the dream of the kid. Here's a perfect example. What you said the tennis player was just assaulted in front of the hotel up in New York. James Blake. What's it? James Blake. James Lake is African-American. Uh, he was number four rated years ago now. He was a uh, very wealthy guy from Harvard. He's a tennis player, obviously a very bright guy. And we, hopefully you've seen the video. He's standing in front of the hotel, minding his own business, well-dressed. And they 
don't come up a question, they come up and knock him to the ground, they say body slam him to the ground with mistaken identity. But because he's who he is, the mayor apologized because he's famous. Right. And the police chief apologized. But how many people who are not famous yeah. tennis that players to? are being body slammed to the ground in New York, Staten Island especially? <laughs> and so there is no apology, there's no anything, and that's what they're seeing. That exceptionalism does not help. But what it does is it, it, the average person of color will look and say, that if it happened to me, I would have already been in jail or, or worse. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that it's, the idea based off your idea that exceptionalism doesn't help, it really builds up this rap and play ball narrative in the black community where you're the only perceived outlets is to be exceptional at uh, and succeed in the music industry or, or in athletics. Those are your only options. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. But <laughs> to, to continue on the idea of um, this, of, of the discussion of individual racism being a form of derailment from what we need to address, which is society, the societal construct of privilege and racism. Um, I think the best case of this is the uh, is Ferguson case, actually. And I know because everybody's very familiar with that. And the discussion of that case is always on a very personal level. Who was Mike Brown? Who was Darren Wilson? Who were these two individuals that interacted with each other? And what happened in that circumstance? What I think what's more, I think what's far more important than their pers their personal interaction is what is the history of that town? Where where do they live? What does it look like? So you have um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> in Ferguson, which is in north north northern. St. Louis, and it's the ninth most segregated metro area in America today. It's more segregated than most towns were in the 50s. It is deeply segregated. And you look at the history of violence, of interactions between police officers and the black community in that neighborhood, and there are 483 black people arrested in 2013 versus 36 of white people. And 92% of searches were of black people, 86% of car stops. But white people were two to three times more likely to be carrying contraband, despite the disproportionality of the searches. Like, there is this, it wasn't an individual occurrence. There was this buildup to the violence that ensued. The reaction of the Ferguson community was not simply to this individual. It was to, uh, to years of oppression by this police department. And the police, the police department in Ferguson looks <laughs> lavish, to say the least. It, and it's built entirely on disproportionate ticketing of the black community there, with a community that already makes ten thousand dollars below the median of the state. So we we have to stop what the media and what we personally are doing is, which is derailment from the issues at hand, which is the societal construct. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself. <laughs> um, looking for comments. Um, going off of what you were just saying about Ferguson, yeah. well, I also think, like, to tie it into, like, privilege. Yeah. You have police privilege, in a way. Because, I mean, through the news, we've seen a lot of things that police officers have done that if any typical average American, whether you're white, you're black, you're rich, or poor, would have went to jail for. But because they have the badge, they have the gun, they have pretty much the power and authority, they pretty much have been given this pass where they might get suspended without pay for like a month and then they're right back to work doing exactly what they were doing. So like, I think that's like another form of privilege is something that we've pretty much given to police officers and people in power. Can I just pose a question, Mrs. Evan, again? The answer I've heard, people who uh, bristle to this white privilege is mm -hmm. saying everyone in the United States has equal opportunity. Um, the fact that you haven't made it is the people who have people haven't made it mm -hmm. is your, your fault. fault. Uh, you uh, in say in poor communities, you don't study hard enough. Mm -hmm. You do too many drugs. Um, you don't pay attention. You have children out of wedlock. This is the whole part of what I've heard, and your position where you are on the lower end of the ladder is because you belong there to your own acts. Well, I, I'm sorry. 
Uh, that's, the, that's the argument I've heard. You know, and and how you would you actually that? did not just one, but three of what I'd say are the six major arguments against this idea of privilege. And I've, I've actually listed them here. If you would want, you, would you like to go to the list? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Go. Go. All right. So I have a list of what are usually the greatest arguments against this idea of privilege. And the first is colorblindness. It's this idea that America is a post-racial society, that the fact that we as a society and sp specific individuals are <laughs> colorblind, that that completely negates the existence of white privilege. And colorblindness is a specifically racially based, but this idea of blindness is that can, act, can be applied to whatever sort of privilege we're discussing at the moment. There's gender blindness and sexuality blindness and whatever. And it's this idea that we as a culture don't care about who you are. It's about how hard you work. You want to address it, everyone address it first? Right. Are we yeah. a colorblind society? Are we post-racial? Exactly. I think we say it. We say that we're colorblind to like hide away from what we actually feel or think. So like if we've ever like if we take a survey of like half of like downtown city of Philadelphia and ask a simple question if it was nighttime and a black guy was walking down the street towards you, would you cross the street? And then ask the same question if it was a white person, predominantly they will all cross the street if it was a black person, not the white person. And if you say that's racist, they automatically is like, no, I don't, I'm not racist. Like, I have black friends. I'm colorblind. I don't, I don't see, like, it's like, I think it's just a way to sweep things under the rug and not talk about it. You know, kind of going over saying, oh, I'm David Pagan again. I'm going over saying, I don't think we're colorblind. So I, didn't, I feel like a lot of people saying, oh, I'm not racist because I have <coughs> this amount of whatever friends, this amount of whatever friends. Like, I feel like they don't realize that a lot of times, they might think they're not racist, but it's also the subconscious thing. So just because you met a person of color or minority and you became friends with them, does not mean you're not racist. Because it's also the initial reaction, like, and which yeah. is a lot of times subconsciously. Like if you mm -hmm. subconsciously, like first reaction to seeing this type of person in this area, versus meeting that person for a long time and actually getting to know that person. Because like racist doesn't mean I'm not gonna get along with that person. They're racist. Is your first reaction to that person, which prejudice? Yeah, the first the initial prejudice could be subconscious. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I'm first. Oh, go ahead. Um, I was gonna say to. I mean. The yes. Hi everyone. My name is Adi. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the concept of a post-racialized society works in tandem with the pick yourself up by the bootstraps theory, the and and it and. I think it's I think it's pertinent that we discuss how the structure of the structures of oppression historically and co contemporarily are not reflected in either of those narratives, and that if you were to take like how Jess was saying, if you were to take some empirical data of contemporary versus uh, historical um, people or people of color in this country, you would see that the data isn't necessarily. Um, uh, hasn't skyrocketed in any different direction as it was as, or as opposed to its remaining constant for however long it has now. And I think that going, th mainly my point is to Jeff, um, like how you said that people, uh, it, like they say they're racist, they retreat within themselves, they tend mm -hmm. to defend themselves. I think saying that someone has uh, has privilege is al also does yeah. the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. and could we like discuss on that? Okay. Well, I was just going to uh, address the idea of colorblindness or, not, or whether or not people see color. And what I've been seeing uh, recently is uh, a lot of people are using that. I oh, sorry. Um, a lot of people are using the idea of colorblindness to uh, kind of discount whether race plays into uh, a particular uh, harm, like with the rash of. Uh, police murders of black people. Um, they, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook recently posted this "All Lives Matter" meme, and I kind of, I, I mean, I tried to, I tried to be diplomatic about it. I tried to tell him that yes, of course, all lives matter, but we don't need, to, we don't need to have it pointed out that all lives matter. The the recent evidence. Right. Suggest that we do need to point out that black lives matter, and it, 
turned into this whole thing and he said, and he, and he eventually told me to stop seeing color. And what he's doing is he's saying that he doesn't see color because it enables him to not attribute what's happening to color. Well, I think to the you've actually touched on a very important point. And it's that even if colorblindness were truly possible, it would still be a problematic perspective. Because to be truly colorblind is to ignore the history that is associated with blackness. It's like to be truly colorblind is to ignore the specific tact and that's supposed to be used when handling and handling the his, the distinct history between African Americans and police and the police brutality. So. Going off of color colorblindness and yes. privilege. This is Jess. Sorry. Going after I have oh, going off of colorblindness and privilege. Um, in the Mimi that you were talking about, um, I feel as though we need to be able to talk about colorblindness, privilege, and Black Lives Matter because just saying Black Lives Matter does not discredit all other lives. It's just saying that right now we need to focus on Black Lives Matter because it's an important topic and it's something that's happening right here, right now, and needs to be looked at and changed, which colorblindness at the same time it's not realistic because we should look at each and every one of us, our different cultures, our different skin complexions, our different heritage, where we're from and what we identify with because it's what makes us unique. It's what makes us different. But the problem is looking at it and then saying it's wrong versus looking at it, appreciating it and learning about it and accepting it. And then with privilege, I think privilege needs to be, <laughs> I think privilege needs to also be looked at in the same way as colorblindness. We should look at everyone's types of privilege that comes with what you are. So if you do have middle class, white privilege, or rich privilege, like whatever privilege is given to you when you're born, you should look at that and see how you can use it to help other people, not just yourself. You should be able to accept your privilege and use it beneficially for other communities, not just yours. Um, I think again, <laughs> that process is so annoying to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree completely with what you're saying, Jess, but I don't think it's as simple as, as everyone acknowledging right. that yes, we have privilege, because even though I'm not white or raised middle class, I, I still have privileges mm -hmm. within myself, is what Jermaine was pointing out. I have light skin privilege, I have, uh, I have passing privilege, I have male privilege, and those are all things that I have that I have had to move forward and learn to accept through educating right. myself and people constantly calling out my privilege in spaces that, exactly. that, I, uh, that I exerted my privilege in. So moving on to helping other people with their privileges first, we have to move past and accept yeah. and acknowledge those privileges. Mm -hmm. And what we were saying earlier about how people, when they're called racist, they retreat within themselves and tend to defend themselves well they do the same people do the same thing yeah. with privilege i didn't acknowledge my male privilege or my passing privilege until someone pointed it out to me and actually had me run through like <laughs> a uh, like a situation or a, a scenario Not, of how it would happen yeah i mean i completely agree i know it's going to be like a hard lengthy process because i mean this is something that's been embedded in our culture for so long and i mean that is the first step to accepting it is actually learning about it and recognizing it but I feel as though, like, you being male, you can have, because a lot of times, like, when you, as a female, like, me as a female, if I would talk out about being turned down for a job because I was a female, you as a male sometimes will have more of a powerful voice than I would. And, like, you accepting that, yeah, you have male privilege, but using it to help, like, the female, cause. yeah, the further someone else's cause, like, if... I have passing privilege too, if you, because I'm light skinned, so I do have that passing privilege. Um, but I could use my privilege as speaking out for people who don't have that passing privilege, because I do know that I do have that privilege and I accept that. But I also know that I can use that to further other communities and help them out in the different struggles that they face. All right. I didn't want to focus on this one for too long, but Ashley. Um, I really kind of wanted to hit the point in what we're talking about having to learn from colorblindness and one of the two things I wanted to point out is that um, one, our education system and our judicial system are probably the main number one things that need to change in order to address this issue of colorblindness and I'm not too familiar with the Philly area but I was born and raised in Chicago on the south side 
and I can assure you that there's a whole massive different kind of dynamic and just what I have seen in is a current massive epidemic in the city with the education system is one, the public school system has been completely defunded and crashed. And uh, then also with the judicial system is there's this issue where a lot of the police force is fo focusing a lot of their attention on the South Side area, which you know happens to have a larger amount of uh, African American population, and they're not focusing any of their attention on the North Side or the West Side, which in the past four years has had a massive heroin epidemic with middle and high class white high school kids. And I cannot even tell you how many high school kids have died because of heroin overdose, because police officers have not been putting any attention on that problem, and they're putting too much attention on bad neighborhoods. Air quotes, by the way. Bad neighborhoods. <laughs> I actually read a really interesting article from The Atlantic about the, uh, about the heroin and opiate epidemic in, um, in middle to upper class uh, white neighborhoods. And it brought to the reader's attention the the dynamic split between the crack and the crack and cocaine epidemic of the of the late seventies and early eighties, moving into the late nineties, which became a heroin epidemic in um in urban, which is code for a uh, black, black neighborhood. <laughs> and and saying is how people didn't care when it was black people doing it, and as soon as white families were crying out in crisis, everyone started to care about the dynamic. So I think that. Is um, Ashley, okay, I had to whisper that. Ashley <laughs> was saying what Ashley was saying about how um, now there's a national outcry about um, about withdrawal about uh, withdrawal drugs. There are uh, clinics opening up in, ma in majority white neighborhoods or right. elsewhere that people in inner cities can get to them, but they're mostly closer to the white people because people can't afford to live in the city unless they have class privilege. But, and actually, continuing off of that issue um, with in the school system being colorblind as well, is that um, if uh, a, someone who is of privilege gets caught with this drug, um, they'll get sent to the counselor. Their parents will be informed. They'll the parent who has the money and the means will send them to rehab. Right. People in other neighborhoods who don't have that privilege, one, they'll immediately get arrested by the police right on school property. They'll be taken to jail. A lot of times people don't have the means to bail their child out of jail, and they don't have the means to send their kid to rehab. So then you've got that massive issue right there. Um, yeah. uh, do you actually touch on something that I wanted to talk about that we won't have time to? The President Industrial Complex and the yeah. air quote struck war. But <laughs> <laughs> the prison, the school pipeline. Um, back to the list of the greatest arguments against this idea of privilege. The second one I have written down is reverse racism. This idea or racism towards white people. The, or the discussion of racism is in and of itself racist. I've been seeing, this is Jessica, I've been seeing a lot of that when it comes to like culture appropriation, especially with like Kylie is the one, right? Kylie, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Get her and Kendall mixed up sometimes. But um, about her with her cornrows, her fox dreads and all of those different things and when people of color say like did you guys hear about Zendaya and her dreads and how they were called like they must smell like pot and stuff like that but Kylie had fox locks just like Zendaya and she was called beautiful she was called like an icon of culture and design and fashion and all that different things like that but then when African Americans and black people, minorities in general, spoke up about like the culture appropriation of someone coming in and taking some, some part of someone's culture, but not actually talking about that culture or standing up for that culture, or like just even taking, like, yeah, just like accepting, knowing, and actually learning about that culture and then actually fighting for it. And by extension, she's also worn a lot of traditional Middle Eastern garb and not face any crimes of terrorism, terrorism when she's going into a public place, as opposed to actual Middle East women who have for wearing their traditional clothing. Mm. But using that for like reverse racism, it's like a lot of people when like especially like in on Facebook and comment sections, when the black people will say this is cultural appropriation, this, that and the third, a lot of 
non-minority members, whites, and different, and other people will sit there and say, well, if a white person said this to you, this would be racist, but you're just doing reverse racism. <laughs> but I mean, reverse racism, I do believe can exist. Like, if a black person literally just sits there and says, I hate all white people and all that stuff, like, <laughs> I mean, that can be reverse racism. I'm not saying it doesn't right. exist, but in the fashion that people use it, it's well, not. I think that, uh, that within the context of what we're speaking right now, we've done a lot to establish that we're speaking about racism and privilege mm -hmm. from an entirely structural and societal perspective, where white people do not experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I, I can tell you, uh, Evan, again, when we do the uh, affirmative action section of Conwell, which you'll be in, Kevin, mm -hmm. that um, people, oh, yeah, you got, yeah, I agree, black people wouldn't put down, yeah, yeah, they have the same opportunity and so forth. But don't give them my position <laughs> yep. in, in a job. Don't give them my position in law school or don't give school, them my salary. School or 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 don't. See, there's limited amount of um, of scholarships. Don't give them what I have in scholarships. Right. So everyone, it's very easy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it comes down to doing what Justice said, it's something is recognizing your privilege and trying to mm -hmm. help others because that is better for society. It's better for all of us. You'll see, and I guarantee you'll see that backlash. That's so the reverse right. racism. You're you're prejudiced against me because I'm white. Exactly. I'm losing that job because I'm white. I'm, I lose. I lost that's black privilege. Right. Yeah. Jermaine, uh, I was going to say, in talking about cultural appropriation and how that is an example of privilege, right. because like for cornrows <laughs> and locks and you know even colorful hair and things like that. From what I've seen, if and you know a black girl does the same thing, she's ghetto. She's ratchet. She's all these things. But if a white woman does it, or a designer in you know fashion week wants to put on their models, it's cutting edge. It's chic, and then it's renamed to something else, like you know, like the Bantu knot, African American hairstyle called Bantu knots. And then yeah. someone put it in their runway show, and it was like pixie knots or something like that. You know, <laughs> very, very cinnamon rolls, like things like that. You know? <laughs> it's like completely taking away from you know this culture and things like that. But it's like it is the wrong how much for centuries. Exactly. So it's like how easy is it where this dominant culture in society is able to say, "I like that." about your culture and I'm going to do that but I'm not going to educate myself on what that is yeah. I'm not going to give you credit and say this to you because I like this piece of it so I can take that but I won't accept everything else about you yeah. I want to say kind of going on like mm -hmm. uh, my name is David Pagangan um, just kind of going on bad it's like how words matter and you see how different things like in media how one act is seen in one way versus another one, like a person does something you could consider terrorism, but another type of person does something it's just a normal for just a crazy person. Right. And I don't know, I forget, you see that John Harvey, one of those like late night I mean, like, politics comedian people on their show, and how when like a group of black people were, had like, they called it a like, middle kind of a riot, right. but then like if there was a group of like white people or college surrounding college white people, they were just saying, "Oh, kids having fun of kids, you know, just getting things getting out of little out of hand versus riot or little out of hand." It's like words like that matter, especially to young kids, because they right. they see the they words, know the they know the words of negative connotations, they match negative connotations with what they see without really realizing mm -hmm. that's happening. And specifically, those San Francisco riots. Uh, over the, I think it was the Giants World Series game. Did they lose, mm -hmm. right? They were like rowdy fans versus the language that was used about the Baltimore mm -hmm. protests. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm kind of jumping back a little bit. This is uh, Freddie again. Um, but I just kind of wanted to address the notion of reverse racism. Right. Um, it's kind of an interesting term, and I'm not sure who coined this, but it, it seems to me to imply that there's an appropriate direction for racism to go. <laughs> yeah. <Right. laughs> racism is towards black people and it's reversed if it's towards white people so which just kind of seemed weird to me yeah, I, just wanna, oh, I just want to ask you quick there I kind of read that racism isn't just white to black or black to white everybody can be racist no matter Spanish black white Asian yeah reverse racism is kind of similar weird to tell it that way because it doesn't 
can't, there's, yeah, it's not just one way or one person to one I mean, quickly from, you know, mm-hmm. my understanding of racism, racism comes with a with power. It's structural. And so that's an argument against reverse racism is like, I don't have the power to oppress you. Mm-hmm. So I can't be racist towards you. I can be prejudiced towards mm-hmm. you. But I can't be racist. I can't hold your whole culture back. I can't implement these systematic things that we're talking about to keep your culture and your people down here. And so, that's the proper sociological definition of racism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Correct. And um, uh, we're not going to have time to go over all of these in depth. But I actually, I wanted to touch on the rest of the ones I have I listed anyway. So we have it's not race, it's economics, and to dispute that. The, there's it. It ties very neatly with the idea of the American meritocracy, the pulling yourself up by your bootstraps method, and it's this idea that if you're not successful and if you are not com- like defeating racism tri- triumphantly, it's because you're simply not working hard enough. And to prove that, the racial wealth gap in the United States has more than tripled since 1984. It, that's an insane statistic. Like that's hard to wrap like wrap my mind around, but it's true. And uh, the education system is flawed from its very basis. Three quarters of African American students go to what's referred to as heavily segregated schools, which means that ninety percent or more of their school is black. And you look at the funding for these schools, and it is just it's grossly disproportionate to say the least. And four fifths of Latino kids go to similarly segregated schools. So it's not just a white and black thing, although I feel like the poor job of discussing other races this was in the talk. Um, another major one is respectability. The idea that if you pull your pants up, if you wear a nice shirt, then maybe you'll be respected as a black person. Maybe in that case, you won't experience racism. And the dean's rolling his eyes at that. About to say, <laughs> the, ten, the tennis player well, literally disproves exactly. that entire thing. And, like, so I hate to break to say Obama, but really, the <laughs> on the debate night, for the on the round debate night, I Googled debate jokes, and all of the ones regarding Obama were racist jokes. Mm-hmm. Were, like, not regarding his liberalism or his policy, solely regarding his race. And it's, it's this idea that, and if you think of the civil rights movement, those were well-dressed men marching in unison peacefully, and they were still opposed, and had dogs stop on them, but, which <laughs> is actually awful, but it's this idea that regardless of how respectable you are, or how decent, air quotes again, <laughs> air quotes in the radio, <laughs> decent you are, you will still face the you will still earn the wage of blackness versus the wage of whiteness. And I think that very neatly covers the meritocracy myth as well, since those two are very tied together. And uh, um, the last one I want to touch on is victim blaming. And it's the entire basis of what's called the new black movement, which is not at all a new idea. It's this idea that (coughs) the victim blaming is largely from the from this, from the perspective where I'm discussing it anyway, is largely from the African American community itself. This idea that those who have made it are allowed to tell those who haven't made it that they simply aren't working hard enough due to either their exceptionalism or their luck for the most part. Because the making it out of the consequences of blackness is based off of both of those things, mostly. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to state like, off yes. of that, Jess, sorry. Mm-hmm. Stating off of that, like, even when they do make it, right. some, they make it and they think, oh, I don't need to give back to my community. Like, they'll do it on their own. They'll have the same opportunities I have. <laughs> even if their opportunities were something that was personally given to them through a personal connection versus through means that everyone can have. So, like, just going off of, like, Philadelphia, Kevin Hart donated how many computers to his old school? Like, that's given back to your community where other, I won't say all <laughs> black stars who make it, most of them don't come back to their community and try to 
further help because they obviously they should know how hard it is for the people in their own community to make it out. Well, I think that plays and, with the myth of the meritocracy where like they believe that they make it it's because they deserved it more than you did. Right. So like, you want. It's fine, no problem. Because I was go ahead. Perfect example is Justice Thomas. Right. Clarence Thomas got his first job uh, because he was black. He was given that opportunity. Right. He got his first uh, judgeship with the federal system because he was the only black Republican, so he got picked for that. He got his job in the Supreme Court of the United States replacing the great Thurgood Marshall mm -hmm. because they needed the only black Republican, basically that was around at that time, who had the credentials, so he got picked. But when he became a Supreme Court Justice in the United States, he has been strongly against any affirmative action of any kind. And I think that's a perfect example right. of, of what you're saying. He doesn't see any reason because he made it. Yeah, he believes that he earned what he hasn't earned. Well, he, he, but he's earned, but right. not, yeah, he exactly. should earn back, like Jeff said, exactly. yeah. he should give back. We're running out of time. I'm sorry, yeah. So go ahead and wrap it up. Um, not sure what I should say. I'm <laughs> really glad you could all join me today. <laughs> 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 and I really hope that we've done a good job of establishing the basis for discussion of privilege and discussion of racism in modern America, as opposed to this antiquated notion that we, that we have what, what racism is.